and welcome to the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors meeting this Tuesday, November 12th. <sighs> we are going to uh, start with our little roll call. Supervisor Howard? Here. Supervisor Hemmingson? Here. Supervisor Gitlin? Here. Supervisor Berkowitz? Here. Chair Cowan? Here. At this time, we'll take a moment of reflection. Jay, could you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready? Again? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Introductions of new employees. Do we have any new employees today? No, seeing none. At this time, I will request any deletions, corrections, or additions from board members to this today's agenda. In order to add an item to the agenda, the matter must have come to the attention of the county subsequent to the posting of the agenda. And the matter requires action before the next regular Board of Supervisors meeting. Do we have anything, gentlemen? Okay. We, I, we, well, do, I we do have an urgency right. item. Yeah. Right. I just want to make sure there was nothing else. Nothing else. So we have an urgency item that came um, before us on Friday. So first I'm going to take a vote um, whether or not that you guys um, are okay with adding this to the agenda. Yes. Yes. Mo move to add. Second. I got a motion and second, Kylie. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Cowan? Yes. We're going to go ahead, if you'd like. Heidi, you want to come up and talk about this, and we'll just take care of it right away? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, well, thank you for adding this as an urgency item. Um, on Friday afternoon, or Friday mid-morning, or mid-afternoon, I was uh, contacted by Sheila Ballant, who is a fuels planner with the U.S. Forest Service, regarding a grant opportunity. Um, it's a CAL FIRE fire prevention grant program grant, and it's very similar to the forest healthy forest grant that we that the Forest Service applied for earlier this year, which they were unsuccessful for. The county was going to be a partner in that grant had they actually received the grant funding. We were going to perform approximately 40 acres of roadside mastication on Big Flat Road. Um, however, in, they did not receive that grant and now we have this new grant. However, they cannot be the applicant on it. And so um, as of right now, I don't know who the actual applicant is going to be. It could be the Smith River Alliance. It could be the Talawadani Nation. Um, other organizations that we have partnered with. So I feel comfortable about us partnering to still do that same element of work if um, the board allows us to uh, send a letter of commitment to whoever the ultimate applicant is on their behalf saying that we would commit to being part of this project. Great, I would move that we send a letter of commitment. Second. I have a motion and second. Any public comment on this urgency item? Seeing none, Kylie? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Cowan? Yes. Okay. Moving on, we're going to start with some reports. Supervisor Berkowitz, you, would you like to kick us off? Oh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Wow, what a week. This was the Del Norte County visit and town hall meeting with our congressman, stake senator, assemblyman, the California Transportation Commission and Caltrans, all on the same day. This was the meeting about the progress that's being made on last chance grade and the accounting for $50 million that are being spent on the environmental and geotechnical studies that will result in a new route around last chance grade. This is the result of many years of hard work by the entire Board of Supervisors, Congressman Huffman, State Senator McGuire, Assemblyman Wood, 
in keeping the pressure on Sacramento and Washington, D.C. to do the right thing. I do want to commend Supervisors Howard and Cowan for the excellent presentation that they made during the meeting. Earlier in the day, I sat in on a public meeting with the California Transportation Commission that was held in our board chambers. They were most impressed with how the entire community is pulling together to see that the bypass for last chance grade gets done, and here's the key word, in a timely manner. Before the town hall, I had a uh, discussion with uh, Senator McGuire where we talked about the next steps that should be taken regarding last chance grade. The next day, I was the guest speaker at the noon Rotary Club where I gave a recap of the previous day's town hall meeting concerning the progress that was being made on last chance grade. Uh, last Saturday, I participated in a rotary project that uh, refurbished Kid Town with a new coat of paint and spreading new wood chips over the entire area. Uh, yesterday, I participated in the dedication of the Veterans Memorial at S-Curve and then marched in the Veterans Day Parade and then had lunch with my fellow veterans. Since our last meeting, I met with uh, Yurok Police Chief O'Rourke in Klamath, where we discussed the various issues regarding law enforcement on the Klamath River. And that's my report, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Supervisor Howard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, definitely enjoyed the festivities of Veterans Day parades yesterday and honoring our veterans and all their service to our country and the work that they'll continue to do for us in the future. It's good to see the great turnout that we have for the parade. It makes me think that there is hope for the future, not only in Delaware County, but in the United States long term and honoring and supporting our veterans that serve this country in so many ways. Um, had some discussions on um, preparing for our Japanese delegation who are going to be arriving here on June 8th with the superintendent of schools, uh, Supervisor Cowan and uh, um, Mayor Enscore, and make an incredible progress to getting this event kicked off that will be funded by the U.S. Embassy in Japan. And it's, it's coming together quite nicely. A lot of hard work going into that by many folks at this time. Um, as Supervisor Berkowitz mentioned, the California Transportation Commission meeting went off extremely well. Um, just to let you guys know that that just doesn't happen overnight. We were one of two communities selected in the state of California for the California Transportation Commission to visit. Let me tell you, it was a lot of hard work in lobbying to ensure that they came here to see us, and we did win that visit. Um, would, that, would that visit came a lot of hard work once that was announced, and I gotta commend not only Tamara Layton, our director of the local Transportation Commission, our local tribes and their staff, the county, staff, the city staff, the harbor staff, everybody that came together to make it work and move flawlessly throughout the day so they could see everything that is happening here in Delnor County. It was an amazing tour, not only of Last Chance Grade, not only of 197, 199 corridor projects, but all the transportation infrastructure projects that the county, city, harbor, and the tribes currently have in the works. And as um, was mentioned, and alluded to in the town hall meeting that Senator McGuire put on by Chair Einman. Um, Fran made mention it is great to see a community come together so strongly and that partnership reflects well on us because they don't see it in just about any other community out there. And this is what's gonna drive this project home for us, especially with last chance grade. So again, thank you to everybody that participated in making what was a very successful day for the tour of the California Transportation Commission in Delnort County. Um, we did attend the day before a Delnort County Local Transportation Commission meeting with Supervisor Hemmingson and uh, Supervisor Gitlin. And in addition, a uh, first five families commission meeting where we discussed at length our budget for the coming year. Also attended the Rowdy Creek Annual Fish Hatchery Dinner Fundraiser. I know there was a lot of events going on that day, but that's where I spent my time. And in addition, also had some conference uh, prep with Senator McGuire the week before for the town hall meeting that he was conducting at the fairgrounds. Also attended a tri-agency meeting where we discussed the USDA loan that we currently have outstanding. 
and constituents concerns around Frosty Lane in uh, District 3 that actually is being addressed today. And super happy that cleanup will take place. Thank you to Dominique Mello and Director Kuntel for working extremely hard in securing grant funds for us to go out there and clean up uh, a very unsightly area. Um, also addressing concerns around uh, some properties on Fred Hate Drive, and thank you again to Dominique Mel Mello for moving that that piece of those projects forward. Um, in a different, in, in addition, had a very strong conference call, which uh, some of this will come up today, with uh, Ryan Becker, who's uh, communications director, vice president at the um, uh, Visit California uh, meeting that resulted uh, after strong conversations with Car uh, Carolyn Pachetta after our RCRC meeting, um, looking to really help spearhead our long distance development of uh, Visit California, specifically to Donald County after the airing of the 2020 Olympics. And I know that's on our agenda here today. Glad to see folks in the audience to represent that conversation. And uh, congratulations uh, to the Del Norte uh, Youth Soccer League, uh, specifically at the high school. Um, they made it again this year to the North Coast sections, uh, lost, in, in that playoff, first playoff game, but congratulations again on getting there. And uh, both Supervisor Cowan and myself both have sons on that team, and uh, they had a valiant effort and a great season and uh, shouldn't give up because it's always great to see these kids achieve excellence, and they certainly did this year. And that's all I have to report, Supervisor. Thank you. Supervisor. Well, as you've all heard, it was a big week in transportation. Uh, our Delmar local transportation commission actually met prior to all of the activities that followed that and we decided some important things including a thirteen thousand dollar road improvement project uh, as part of the safe routes to school program which will impact uh, mary peacock school ingress and egress in that area we continue to get a lot of calls uh, regarding the status of wonder stump um, uh, our cdd department has requested an additional ten thousand dollars in funds um, for purposes of engaging the public in stakeholder engagement. Uh, there will be op ample opportunity uh, to uh, you, the public, t to weigh in on this uh, controversial issue of Wonder Stump Road, and you'll have your, your, your day to, and several of them, to let uh, our roads department and the county know exactly your feelings on uh, Wonder Stump Road. Um, Wednesday, the California Transportation Commission met last Wednesday and our board dais, they were sitting up here. And uh, this is a really an imposing event to see. It was quite impressive to see expert from city, county, harbor making superb presentations on the transportation needs of our remote county. And I was very proud to see that everybody's on the same page. Of course, the big subject of this last chance grade and how we're gonna solve this problem. Um, the timeline was not adjusted, even though a number of, a couple of the commissioners at the State Transportation Commission said, why hasn't the time giant line been adjusted? But the $50 million allocated essentially goes to uh, continuation of economic or uh, impact studies, not economic studies, but the environmental studies, I should say, uh, in this area, and that will continue through the year 2026. It might be accelerated, we don't know. We're trying to get it accelerated, but it's kind of like threading a needle. You've got to do your homework on, on everything you do. Um, and then uh, one thing that was uh, said by Jamie Mattioli, uh, who was the director of the project of Last Chance Grade, as of, of the routes, uh, they've eliminated four different routes uh, for a number of reasons, which I believe remains three standing plus the existing alignment. But he said there's a very strong possibility there'll be a new route uh, that will be studied. So a lot of things are in play for this possibly $1 billion project of last chance grade. Um, as you uh, mentioned from Supervisor Howard and, and um, Berkowitz before, uh, Senator McGuire, uh, Assemblymember Wood, and Congressman Huffman hosted uh, the town hall at last chance grade. It's very encouraging to see all of the elected state and federal representatives under one roof discussing what all three agreed was the single most important priority in Del Norte County, which is the replacement of the bypass of Last Chance Grade. So glad to see that. Of course, the question come, comes up is how do you accelerate the timeline? 
prior to the ultimate completion of the road in 2039. Lots of things can happen between now and then. We know they will, and keeping that road open will be indeed a challenge. Uh, yesterday, I observed uh, Veterans Day ceremonies at the Point of Honor along and was on the parade, uh, observed from the parade route. Uh, the Veterans Committee paid homage to 42 Del Norders who made that ultimate sacrifice in defense of their country. I want to thank uh, former Police Chief Doug Plack for reading each one of those 42 heroes' names and those heroes who gave their all to America. So I salute every veteran who selflessly has served so we may enjoy the freedoms that we have today. And finally, I met with County Tax Assessor Jennifer Perry and her staff. Many of you, of course, have your tax bills, and 1,300 parcels were reassessed in a upward direction. And uh, that means more income for Delnor County's general fund. The 2019, 2010, 2020 tax year created a bit of this windfall. And um, we don't get all that money. Of course, uh, it goes to Sacramento, and we retain 19, we get 19 cents of every tax dollar, property tax dollar that's expended. So uh, these funds will augment our general funds. So, Madam Chair, I would respectfully request for our December meeting that Assessor Perry come before our board to report how much anticipated new income will come into the general fund. That's my report. Thank you. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, busy couple of weeks. Um, started off with the uh, Resource Conservation and Development meeting in Weaverville. Um, which uh, was moving along just, just fine. Uh, had a shrimp webinar where we're attempting to get MSC certification for the shrimp industry. Uh, that's moving forward. Uh, had a meeting with staff to discuss the railroad extension. And then uh, uh, Chair Cowan and, and uh, I were off to Washington, D.C., where we had uh, several several meetings we had meetings with the department of i'm not going to go into too much detail if the chairman wants to go into more detail i'll, I'll let her but uh, we had department of uh, transportation uh, meeting uh, uh, regarding the essential air service uh, with uh, kevin schlemmer um, and you know we're kind of the poster county for essential uh, air service uh, we fit all the criteria very well uh, and uh, happy to work with uh, with uh, Kevin, he's been really good to work with uh, throughout uh, um, having essential air service, so he's a great supporter. Uh, we had a meeting uh, with uh, the U.S. Uh, Interagency Council on Homelessness. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, um, Lindsay Knotts gave us uh, quite a few suggestions on where we should go, what we should do. Um, had a meeting uh, with Hi uh, House Highways and Transit Subcommittee, uh, Helena uh, Zablikowicz uh, on last chance grade, um, mostly on last chance grade, but we did uh, stick, uh, you know, mentioned 199, 197. And then uh, after that meeting, had a chance meeting with uh, Congressman Peter DeFazio, who is the chair of that, uh, and uh, uh, just uh, a few minutes with him, but he mentioned last chance grade. So all of these people that we met with, uh, I would say 90% of them already knew about last chance grade, uh, are aware of what's going on. So it's, uh, it's, it's really nice, uh, uh, really nice to hear that, uh, to come back to us. Uh, had a meeting with Dr. Britt Weinstock, um, uh, from the Senate health education, labor and pension committee. Um, that was a very interesting meeting. Uh, talked about rural health care, uh, as well as the Older Americans Act. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we had so many meetings and we were kind of running behind, so we, we split up into a couple of groups so we could meet, meet with other uh, people or uh, scheduled meetings that we had so we didn't miss them. Uh, and uh, uh, Greg Burns and I went to uh, Senator uh, Kamala Harris's uh, office uh, and of course uh, uh, all these meetings we talk about last chance grade uh, secure rural schools uh, aviation fuel tax pilt uh, older americans act um, uh, those those are just kind of automatic things and then of course the discussion always gets into other things and if 
the chairman wants to talk about that, she can. I uh, went to Senator Feinstein, Feinstein's office, uh, talked with staff on those same things, uh, last chance grade, SRS, PILT, Aviation Fuel Tax, EAS, Older Americans Act. And we went uh, on day two, we went over to the White House uh, Office of Governmental Affairs and met with James Aiken uh, and uh, talked about last chance grade, of course, SRS, PILT. Uh, and he said that on some of these things we should be, on last chance grade, of course, he said we should uh, talk with Ann Renneke uh, and our next meeting. We went to the Department of Transportation. She wasn't on our list, but who was there but Ann Renneke. So we had an opportunity to talk about last chance grade with her. Uh, I went to Congressman uh, LaMalfa's office and Mike and Congressman Mike Thompson's office, talked about those same things, last chance grade, SRS, PILT. Uh, aviation Fuel Tax, EAS, uh, Older Americans Act, all those, uh, all those things. Uh, I went to House Committee on uh, Ways and Means, uh, the Health Subcommittee, talked about rural health care. That was uh, um, also very interesting and also uh, met, with, uh, met with Congressman Huffman's staff. He, he was not available to, he, because he was uh, on the uh, West Coast, he was not able to meet with us. And uh, so anyway, it was a long couple of days. Uh, I think we uh, made uh, some good progress. So um, it was all all good. Um, then coming back, we, of course, we ever, uh, it's been discussed that we had the Local Transportation Commission meeting and as well, uh, um, Supervisor Howard and I met with, uh, with Congressman Huffman um, on his public lands bill um, and uh, had some pre-meetings uh, before McGuire's uh, town hall meeting uh, with last chance grade. Uh, of course, the, uh, went to the um, Transportation Commission meeting uh, and then McGuire's town hall meeting later met with uh, McGuire, Wood, Huffman uh, prior to that meeting uh, and then uh, uh, later in the week, uh, had a gear innovations meeting uh, for uh, Dungeness Crab. Had a Border Coast Regional Airport Authority meeting. Went to the flag raising uh, ceremony at the Point of Honor, uh, as was mentioned, uh, and uh, attended the Veterans Day Parade. And that was it for me. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, after our last meeting, I went over to the high school and was able to listen to Assemblyman Wood address the Health Career Pathways class, something true to my heart, so that was very interesting. Um, <clears throat> had a meeting to go over scheduling and panels for Sister City, the December 8th visit. Uh, had a meeting, Tony and I went over to True North to discuss homelessness and the next steps that are being taken. Met with Jeff Harris and the rest of the group, again, to go over sister city meetings. I think I've had about seven in the last two weeks, so I'll just leave it at that. Went to Washington, D.C. as Supervisor Hemmingson um, just went over, so I'm not going to go over our schedule at all. It was two long days of meetings. Um, I love it. I love my job. I love doing that part of it. What I took away that... Um, you know, going back and meeting with these people and them knowing who we are, you know, walking into DOT and having a conversation. Um, and they not only know our airport, they know our carrier personally, they know our director. I've met them before, Jerry's met them before, and we can have um, frank discussions of what we need and, and moving forward. That is what relationships and partnerships are all about. And the big takeaway for me that I shared um, last week was being able to walk in these rooms and seeing people that we've met in the past and them not only knowing where Del Norte County is, but they know our project, they know Last Chance Grade. Someone said it, I think, at the White House meeting, you know, ask early and often. And um, the relationships and the asks and the continuous uh, push that has been going on, at least for me for the last three years, really showed, um, you know, that it's getting across. They know who we are in Washington, D.C., and that's important because everybody needs to come to the table, not just all our stakeholders um, here in our, in, in, the, in our state, but also federally. So um, really, really good meetings um, and good takeaway. I won't go through all of them. You heard all the meetings we had. I don't think you missed a beat on those. Um, 
uh, had a meeting with Supervisor Howard, City Manager Weir, along with Senator McGuire to go over the town hall um, when California Transportation C Commission was here. Then um, later that day had a one-on-one -on -one with Senator McGuire and myself just to discuss um, what's going on with homelessness and what we've been working on as well as last chance grade, the RN program, which will be starting in 2020, another just true to my heart, and uh, the trip to DC participated in Sunrise Rotary's Taste of Del Norte. Um, my husband and I do it every year um, as participants from our restaurant. I enjoy it, it's a great time to see everybody. That was the same night as Rowdy Creek. Last year I was able to do Rowdy Creek, but missed it this year, unfortunately, because they clashed. But um, Rotary was good, um, and that's always a big turnout. I think Cancer for Country for Cancer was that night as well. A lot of good things going on in our community. Um, they do a lot for fundraising, and it's, it's, it's really good to see. Had a meeting with Sutter Coast Hospital to go over all the logistics on an upcoming event in December. Met with Daphne from Our Daily Bread to go over the um, progress of what's going on there currently right now. Heather's group's in there doing um, mental health services. They're feeding people. We've got lockers installed, but we're also, she's moving forward with a new nonprofit. We're working on getting that shelter open. Um, had agenda review for this meeting. Had a women's empowerment meeting. Um, then, as was discussed um, by everybody here, um, had the opportunity to spend the day with um, the executive director of California Transportation Commission, as well as a couple of the commissioners, the chair and the co-chair for California Transportation Commission and staff um, went down early in the morning and walked the grade. I had the privilege privilege along with uh, Supervisor Howard in March to go before them in LA and to see these people and talk about what it means to um, Del Norte County and to watch them ask the question, why is it taking so long and what can we do? Um, that was the day that they committed the remainder of the money that gave us the $50 million to go forward with an alternate route. I know they've put, as we all do, a lot of money into the current route, but I can't say this enough. This is the first time that money is going into an alternate route. So yes, studies have been done in the past on this route. We know this route does not work. Now we are looking at um, alternate routes. And just a little clarification, there's still six routes plus um, the current one, which makes it seven, not three. We have um, Supervisor Heminson and myself sit on the last chance grades uh, stakeholders group. So I've been part of that for about three years. And we meet regularly and get into really um, all the nitty gritty of what's going on in the different studies and stuff. So we have knocked off all the C's, which was two or three, but others have been added. Um, the area that we're looking at has definitely shrunk, which is really great. So um, that's good. But back to the commission, having them here, spending the day with them, building those relationships again, being able to meet them in LA, having them, inviting them up here. Howard had talked about the work it took to get them here, but. It, being on the bus, stepping off the bus, and walking the grade with them. I can't emphasize enough whenever we invite somebody. It's one way to look at it on paper. It's a whole, whole different ball game when you walk it and you see it firsthand and you drive it. So it's really, really important for everybody to see that. So it was great to be able to do that with them, experience with them. I attended their meeting, and then I had uh, the privilege of being able to speak for the community and talk about um, once again in the town hall about what it means to Del Norte County um, if we were to lose our road before we get the alternate up and going. Um, one thing that stuck out to uh, the vice chair, Paul, made a comment after, it was in between meetings. He was very impressed, as was stated, about the people that came to the meeting. And he said to me, wow, so will we see the same people tonight at the town hall? And I said, no, you'll see a whole different group. Um, he says, we're used to showing up and seeing about 10 staffers that, that need to be there or forced to be there. So the effort that we put in the outreach and the community that showed up not only at the meeting at two, but the town hall at the evening made a big impact on them. We finished our evening off of the rec having dinner with these folks, kind of um, just going over the day. Again, those relationships, being able to have that one-on-one -on -one time over dinner and talk about what it means is huge. A little side note, the night they flew in, it was fogged in and they had to go to um, Medford and get bussed over. Yeah, kind of sorry it happened to them, but kind of sorry not. It really um, 
drove it home of what we have to go through in a small county. Um, that that is our daily life, and that's what happens. And for the Transportation Commission to see that was kind of kind of perfect. It was kind of a joke. Did you guys do that on purpose? Well, no, it had been gorgeous until that night, but it worked out, and it it really kind of drove it home of what we go through on a daily basis for them to see. Okay, great visit. Thank you for all who did work on that. It, it couldn't have gone better. Had a meeting down at Klamath uh, with Sue Mastin, um, attended the Republicans' women's lunch, had a Border Coast Regional Airport Authority meeting, met with Grant Worschkel and da uh, Sam Davidson from Trout Unlimited, had a solid, oh, Solid Waste Authority, I had a gender review for them, and I was able yesterday to um, attend the raising of the flag, and uh, I really enjoy that. Uh, watching um, our veterans and the memorial and all the work hard work that's gone into that um, all the behind the scenes and it was really a nice event and a beautiful day uh, i had to go to work so i missed the parade but i was able to kind of watch it live on facebook so that was nice and that was it for me so we're going to move on to the consent agenda at this time madam chair i'd like to uh, remove for discussion items six seven eight and nine Six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, do I have any public comment on consent agenda items only? Uh, those are items one through 21 minus six, seven, eight, and nine. Yes, come on up. Linda Sutter. Item six, seven, eight, and nine. I know you're going to pull them for discussion, but I'm just going to go ahead and speak. It appears that three board members get to do, are assigned to all of these year after year after year. I don't understand that. You supervisors have the power and the chance to make Del Norte County a great place to live, work, and raise a family. However, three of you are, are passive followers and not leaders. During that last chance grade thing that we just went to last week, Mr. Howard, you presented how, uh, how the environmentalists were slowing down uh, the unsafe STA process because of 199-197, and that wasn't re in regards to the last chance grade. Ms. Cowan didn't have a proper speech prepared, spewed substandard words of no substance. McGuire wanted to talk about how Jared Huffman was progressing in health care bills. The community there was for last chance grade. Susan Brunson of Caltrans wanted to give us a history of how Caltrans was created and how Caltrans is not a political entity. Nothing about last chance grade. Fifteen minutes was spent by Molo Matoli explaining the stages and what we are doing right now. The public was graciously then given 15 minutes to ask questions. Caltrans made it perfectly clear that the Pacific Highway of Malibu, which collapsed in 2017, was an emergency and rebuilt immediately. But people who perished at the last chance grade were not important, nor was it an emergency for 50 years ago or today. Your leadership is lacking. None of you could develop a pertinent question to ask Caltrans, which means one thing. You are adequately, uh, you are not adequately rep representing the 5th District where the last chance grade is placed. Bob Berkowitz should have been, been, should have been on that board all these years, but you pushed him out, Madam Chair. Lastly, the Coastal, co well, that's it in regards to that. And Mr. Berkowitz, I'm disappointed in your report about last chance grade today because you're cowing down. I don't expect that for my fifth district leader. And I see Mr. Short is in the audience. He couldn't even develop a question to ask Caltrans. Where's the leadership, folks? Thank you for your comments. Any other comments on consent agenda items only? Okay. Move to approve consent agenda. Minus six, seven, eight, nine, I assume? Yes, minus six, seven, eight, and nine. Thank you. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. 
A motion and a second on consent agenda items 1 through 21 minus 6, 7, 8, and 9. Kylie? Supervisor Hemmingson? Uh, yes, I need to recuse myself on item number 13. Coast Auto is a customer of mine. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Chair Cowan? Yes. Okay, we are going to go through um, item six, seven, eight, and nine. Do you want to take them as one, Mr. Gitlin, and explain your reasons? Yeah, I'll, I'll make it very succinct and short. Uh, this board continues to act not as a board of supervisors of five, but as a gang of three. It's disappointing. It goes on um, year after year. It's too bad. There's 40% of the county which is not being adequately represented on a whole myriad of commissions and one areas that should have the influence of these two areas. Uh, so, Kylie, you can register my no votes on six, seven, eight, and nine. Madam Chair, I would move that we approve the items six, seven, eight, and nine. Second. Any public comment on item six, seven, eight, and nine? Seeing none, Kylie? Uh, okay. My name's Tony Barnes. I rep represent myself and Tavern Associates. I'm sorry, but I do have to agree with Roger Gitlin's observation. There, doesn't, there really does seem to be a gang of three on the board, and you are five members and we need to have adequate represent, representation for the entire county. So, you know, uh, I just want that noted, that it is just not his observation, but mine and other members in the community also. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, Supervisor Brickwitz. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I think you realize, of course, that the entire community is picking up on this, that no matter what happens, what boards or commissions that are chosen, you will eliminate Berkowitz and Clinton. It's, it's a standard operating procedure. It's unfortunate, but it's true, you know, that we do have a gang of three and we don't have a board of five. Supervisor Howard. Yeah, if, if I may, because this comes up every year and before I got on the board, there was a couple supervisors that took these positions. And I just want the community to know and the public to know that it's not a gang of three thing. It's about the board having representation on our lobbying associations. And in order to do that, it's about establishing relationships and consistency in those relationships year to year. And it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, and it especially doesn't happen overnight if you're on RCRC with 39 counties represented, represented or if on CSAC with 58 counties represented. It takes time. And in order to get that relationship established, and more importantly, move in positions of authority within each of those organizations to better direct rural needs, which is extremely important to Dillnar County, and what some previous supervisors did do, specifically in District 5, was to become chairs in high-ranking positions to drive rural issues, especially Delnar County issues, during a period of time when they are president or vice chair of these organizations. And it was extremely effective for us. So even though this is only my third year now on CSAC, and, and I'm not represented in any of the six, seven, or eight votes on this here today, I do want to say having consistency in representation on these lobbying associations for us at the state level, RCRC here that we're discussing today is extremely important for making that case move forward for rural representation. So that's all I have to say, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Hemmingham. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's, the, it's been the policy of this board uh, um, that if you're sitting on a committee, um, you don't get removed from that committee unless you choose to be removed from that committee. Um, even though it's happened in the past and some people have been asked to be removed from uh, positions uh, on committees. Um, and, and I don't think that it should be thought of as a gang of three. When I first came on this board, David Finnegan represented CSAC and RCRC, and he did it for 
eight years while I was on the board. And nobody said it was a gang of one, and nobody was whining and sniveling about all this, uh, um, the activity, because um, I think the county is well represented in these areas. And, and they don't talk about the committees that they are on. They're on a lot of committees. Talk about those. Talk about the things that you can do that you are on. Don't be sniveling. If you want to vote against us from being on here, that's one thing. But don't think you should just be put on just because. It gets a little old. Thank you. Um, I can't um, say again. I agree. It's about relationships and partnerships, and you. it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, the representation that we do have at CSAC and RCRC, I respect, and they're doing a great job, and it is, you need that longevity there at the state level. But I want to point out, all five of us attend the meetings at RCRC annually, as well as um, their ledge days, as well as RCRC. So every one of us has the opportunity to represent. District 5 is being represented at RCRC. District 5 is being represented at CSAC, because Mr. Berkowitz makes that trip once and twice, three times a year, three different trips. So they are being representative. Don't think that your counties or your districts are not. Um, all five of us go to these and all five of us represent. It's just at their board meetings, that extra meeting, we have representation there to speak. And they, they don't go out on their own. They speak of our board's um, policies, and, you know, our platform, um, which is decided upon, again, all five of us. So they're speaking for the board. Um, and that's important for everybody to know and understand how that works. So I have a motion and a second. Kylie? Supervisor Berkowitz. Reluctantly vote yes. Supervisor Gitlin? No. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Cowan? Yes. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our schedule items at this time. Um, com yeah. <laughs> um, the first... Uh, <laughs> Timed item is our comment period at 1025. We're running a little late. Members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of our board. If you're addressing the board regarding a matter that is already listed on our agenda, you may be asked to hold your comments. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. So at this time, we will take uh, public comment. I'm sorry that I'm speaking so much, but Listen, I, you know, I, I really take offense to comments of a supervisor talking to other supervisors about whining and sniveling. This is what we're talking about. You know, you guys are a group of people that are supposed to represent us. You're not supposed to get up here and bicker among yourselves and pick sides. That was a very inappropriate comment that you made about whining and sniveling. You know, do you really belong on the board to make those kind of comments? I really am offended at that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments at this time? Linda Sutter. This weekend on CBSN, they uh, had a short film on the homeless situation down in LA. And one of the ladies that they interviewed was a lady who owned a 2006 BMW. And she was homeless on the street with her daughter. And the reason she was homeless on the street with her daughter is because she had gone through a divorce, the rent had gone out of control, and she could not afford to pay rent. Going rent down there is $2,400 a month for God knows what. I got a letter from the Coastal Commission, and there's 91 locks lots being developed on Lake Girl Drive. Homes are going to be built. I please beg you guys, set an example for the state. Do something. I don't know what you can do, but we need to have affordable homes to put people in houses. This is, we could set the example here. You got to do some work, do some due diligence. Look for programs, look for something, but help your people here. Now, yeah, we've got mentally ill and we've got the drug addicts, just like LA.
but it's not as bad. If you guys would use your energy to focus on something, developing something that the whole state could benefit from, look at what Del Norte County's doing. Let's get these people in a home, not just a renting place, but a home. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm just here once again to, uh, I'm the one that uh, filed the complaint against uh, the Sticky Grove uh, Wonder Stump at 1070-101. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, here to reiterate my complaint that I believe that they're in violation of operating in violation of Title 20, Chapter 67, Section 50 of the ordinance. And, um, and that's pretty much it. Um, it is a juvenile center or a juvenile youth center, the, the, um, uh, the juvenile hall, and it does operate a school. And um, I talked to ex-judge uh, Rich Harper, and he said he agreed with me that it was a school and that if we continue down this road, I guess maybe we should get in in front of a magistrate and get an actual determination by a judge. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm seeking a cease and desist in immediately on that, uh, that operation. Hi, my name is Robert DeRigo, uh, county, county resident and uh, owner of Sticky Grove. Um, you know, I sat a couple of years uh, working towards uh, being able to exist. And uh, the maps that, I'm just going to go ahead and submit them now, but the maps that uh, I submitted. Do you want to wait till your present, the presentation from Joel at 1055? We'll take that opportunity as well. Um, the maps that I submitted, uh, were the maps that the county prepared uh, trying to find sensitive uses. Um, originally the map had um, McCarthy School on it at the juvenile hall. During one of the meetings for the cannabis work group, uh, Heidi Kunstai noted uh, when someone asked why the school had disappeared on a, on a new version of the map, said the school no longer operated there. Um, I looked online, sure enough it, it did not seem to exist anymore. Um, since I've opened on Google Maps, now you can find Elk Creek School there. You know, I'd always uh, assume that maybe there could be an issue later on with this, but I also know that uh, county council had said, well, if a sensitive use arises later, we're not going to ask a business to relocate. Um, as far as whether you consider juvenile hall a school, I don't, I don't know. Um, I believe that the detractor in my case is affiliated with the dispensary on Northcrest um, and, and Patty in general, you know, so I, I think I might be getting a little bit of uh, retaliation in, in some ways. But um, I've still got a minute left. I do believe we should have tip cups for McDonald's, Burger King, Papa Murphy's. In my experience, tip cups add one week's extra pay to everybody's paycheck in the month. Uh, our location, I think it might be quite a bit more than that for our staff. But at Starbucks, I made an extra week's pay every four weeks in tips. We don't have to ask anybody to raise the minimum wage. Uh, fast food workers are, live probably an average of three or four days a year in their car. So you can see kind of where homeless is starting with the working adult. These jobs are not for juveniles anymore. Labor laws preclude uh, juveniles working with a lot of the equipment you find in a fast food restaurant and over the course of the Clinton administration we lost a lot of our manufacturing jobs you know right as we had lost all our timber and and recently I noticed Safeway is uh, using self-checkout I'd like to see the county encourage our large Wall Street retailers to avoid self-checkout uh, that's how I made my living for five years at ShopSmart I would say 60 70 percent of my hours were helping people and I enjoyed uh, helping people. And, and I think the public got better service. We were able to catch shoplifters and things like that. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thank you. Any other public comment? Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Patty McCauley, longtime resident. Um, just a comment in response to the retaliation. 
I just want what's fair. You know, if it's if a closed school is a closed campus, if a juvenile hall is a closed campus, closed school, they should both be considered the same. Um, I'm just seeking to get my grandfather in. It was Prop 64 to be able to exist. I care about children. I was a longtime art student teacher here in Del Norte County for 18 years. Taught kindergarten through eighth grade. And children are my concern. And I feel that my place of business is not uh, in jeopardy of uh, affecting any youth. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment at this time? Okay, I see a number. We're going to go into item 23, cybersecurity update. Mr. McCorkle. <clears throat> Thank you. It should be coming up here in a second. Unless we were hacked. Uh, a couple months ago, Supervisor Berkowitz approached me and uh, indicated he heard a lot in the news about cyber attacks on government agencies and asked if I could come in front of the board and talk about what the county is doing to protect the county networks from that. Um, at the time, I told him, well, you know, we don't typically talk a lot about it. We try to keep it private, but it's a, it's a valid topic and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk in some generalities on how we do it. I won't get into very specifics, but it's a... Uh, I don't know who's doing that. Okay. <laughs> so I'll talk about it first a little bit. So um, <laughs> it is something that uh, we deal with on a daily basis. We have a lot of requirements from uh, different agencies that we work with, Department of Justice, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Mental Health, Child Support. All of them have different requirements that we have to deal with. Um, but I will... Well, um, ransomware is a big issue uh, with government agencies. So uh, this slide, which is somewhat old, says at least 170 county, city, or state government systems were had ransomware on them since 2013 and 22 in the first half of 2019. Uh, so if you don't know ransomware, when they get on their computers, it encrypts the data on the computer or servers, and it holds them ransom. And you can't unlock it or decrypt it unless you pay the ransom person money, it's usually through a a different kind of a currency like a Bitcoin. Um, some people think if you just turn it over to the FBI or CIA, they'll decrypt it for you. But the fact is, is there is no way to decrypt the data once it's encrypted. Uh, nobody has that ability. And uh, several agencies have paid the money. The uh, federal government asks us not to pay the money because they don't want to encourage this to happen. But it's become a, a multi-billion dollar industry. So. Um, the attacks keep happening and uh, governments are at risk because they have money. So here's some, a list of some attacks that have happened. Um, and it talks about, um, so the, the first one was in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, next one, Lake City, Florida, and they actually paid the ransomware. Um, I don't know the details about every one, but we do try to follow these. Several of these people have uh, paid ransomware. The city of Baltimore but it was a very uh, public one. I don't know if they paid or not, but there's some big cities that have been hit. Um, airports, uh, Augusta, Maine. Let's see. Um, the city of Tallahassee lost almost $500,000. I think money somehow was stolen from them. They didn't pay. Um, but you'll see Jackson County, uh, Georgia admitted they paid $400,000 to unlock their data. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia was a huge one. Nobody knows if they paid or how they got um, through it, but that lasted weeks for them. Um, yeah, Department of Transportation uh, was also temporarily shut down. Here's some other ones that have happened recently. 22 towns in Texas kind of happened really uh, quick within a short period of time. They were all hit with ransomware. There's some um, school districts in California. Um, again, the one in Atlanta, um, Lodi had some issues too, and we're not sure whether they paid or not. Uh, Del Norte County has been hit with a couple ransomware. It's actually been several years, but we had two instances so far where um, 
um, employees clicked on a, an email that took them to a site that got something onto the computer and it did lock some stuff on their computer and on the county network. Uh, we were able to recover because the county network we back up and we were able to retrieve that data. The data that was on their uh, computer itself was lost. We didn't pay any money. So, but it, it has happened to us. So in the past, we think about viruses. A lot of people at home thought, oh, it's not really happening to us. This is only in big places. It's happening to everyone and it's growing very rapidly. So it is a, a serious topic and something we should talk about. So to answer the question, how do we protect the county network? Um, we maintain up-to-date firewalls, and I'll talk a little bit about what those firewalls are, how we do it. Uh, it's important to keep software up-to-date, so it's not just the county and everybody out there listening should keep their own software up-to-date. Uh, backups, backups are very important, and there's some specific ways we do it to protect us from ransomware. Uh, limit network access, that's a big one. Um, and we'll talk about that one more, and we train employees. Our firewalls, we invested last year, last fiscal year, we invested about $70,000, um, and most of which came from state agencies, Cal OES, we used grants from Cal OES. We also use other state agency money. Um, it's a big topic out there, so there is some funding for it. So that $70,000 bought us a variety of pieces of equipment that we could put what we call on the outside of our network. Um, you can consider where the internet hits our network. Those are where those devices go. Everybody always thinks of the internet, but we also have a lot of other connections. We connect to the state. Uh, I don't know, there might be 10 different connections out there between uh, health and human services, mental health, child support, uh, sheriff's office, probation. They all have their unique individual connections out to the state somehow. All those connections have to be protected. We don't automatically trust it because it's the state. Um, actually, we see most of the inadvertent activity coming from those state links. So there's a lot of connections out there. They come into different departments. We put these devices out there to monitor that traffic. Um, I can't really tell you how it monitors it. It's an industry standard system that we buy. Um, the, uh, the companies themselves update it. Um, we'll hear a lot of times from our uh, county employees are able to go to a website one day and the next day it's reported that it's blocked. It's not us, it's not county IT sitting there trying to block everybody. We use these standard lists and somehow a site got on a list and then we make a determination whether we unblock it or allow it to go through. Um, we also monitor people that come and access the county websites. Um, and you would think Delaware County, nothing really happens. But at least once a week, we have a system that if there's some of our accounts that are, have too many incorrect passwords, um, it'll lock it out. It happens at least once a week and it is somebody maliciously trying to, trying to get into our stuff. <clears throat> Um, we've had other people trying to uh, connect to our websites and pull certain information in ways that we don't allow, and we've had to make those adjustments. So it is happening to us. Software updated. We have over 30 servers and over 500 computers. Um, it's important to update the software, so you have to realize when Microsoft um, announces or they put out a release and say they update your computer, um, it's not because they just heard of that attack. That attack probably happened months ago and they're, they're finally figured out a way to block it. So when they announce that those updates are out there, we try to jump on those very quickly and we recommend everybody update your phones and, and computers when those updates come out. We utilize a network monitoring tool that monitors all of our computers and all of our servers. Uh, and gives us a total inventory of what software is on there. If new software pops up, we see it um, because it may mean that we didn't install it and it's some kind of a virus. It also tells us the versions of each piece of our software. So there's one that we just did last week. We didn't really tell employees, but it was a vulnerability that was announced by one of our vendors. So we can monitor that that update happened um, and you know we were able to apply the update. Every once in a while, county employees get an email from me saying, we really need you to reboot your computer now. Um, that's, that's because sometimes we can update, but it doesn't really take effect until your computer is rebooted. So we need to make sure we can force that reboot to happen. And we do that sometimes. Um, but we usually don't announce the entire reason of it when we do it. We back up our data, so our data gets backed up at least daily. Um, we have critical applications, uh, property tax system, the recording system, all those deeds and stuff that get recorded, of course they're electronic and they go into systems and it's very important we back those up in case something were to happen. And we've been doing that, but this year we've actually contracted with a vendor to come up with a new backup system um, to better protect us from ransomware, specifically from ransomware. It's more efficient, it'll back up quicker, 
And then the thing about ransomware for people at home, if you have uh, some people buy external hard drives, they plug it into their computer, they back up their data. If you leave it plugged into your computer and the ransomware gets onto your computer, it'll then just go attached to your backup and lock your backup. So we've heard of that happening to other counties. So we're getting into a system that protects us from that kind of situation. Basically, it backs up our data, removes it from our network, doesn't provide access. If we want the data back, we go through a certain procedure to get the data back. But our rights, our ability doesn't have a, a direct connection to that backup. So backups are very important. This year, we're spending a little over $30,000 for this system. It's a lot of money to try to protect us. We limit network access. Uh, a lot of times, a county department will come in and say, you know, it's just easier just give the employee access to everything because I'm not sure which folders, I don't want to nitpick which folders they need access to. We don't allow that to happen. We, we go with the principle, which most counties should do, of least privilege. You tell us exactly what they need access to, and we only provide access to that. You can understand that way, if that employee did something and they clicked on it and they got ransomware, the only thing we're going to lose is what they had access to. Don't give them access to more than what they should because it can just hurt. It can reach more stuff. In the two instances that we had, luckily those employees didn't have a lot of access, so it was only what they needed, and we were able to recover pretty quickly from that. Um, multiple incorrect logins, we typically lock people out, IT staff, there's 10 of us, we all get notifications when this kind of stuff happens. Um, we act on it pretty quickly. And then most county employees have gotten used to this, but they're not allowed, they don't really have access to their computers to install their own software. I would say years, I've been here a long time. Years ago, we did allow it, and we had a horrible time with uh, malware and different things that would get on the computer. Since we changed that policy, uh, we have very few of those instances. And this prevents a ransomware attack or that piece of software from installing itself on the computer. So we can't do that in every case, but it helps protect us from uh, software getting installed automatically. This is an example. Our biggest threat right now is phishing emails. All those. Uh, attacks that you saw that we had on there, most of them came from phishing emails, and we all get them. They try to get you to click. This was an example, and we have many, but this is the IRS. It looks scary. It's the IRS. But, um, you know, if you get something from the IRS and it says, we made a mistake and we're going to pay you money, it's obviously not true. We know the IRS doesn't do that. Um, the other thing we train on is that there's links usually in these emails, and if you hover over the link, don't click on it. If you hover, down at the bottom of your browser, it tells them where the link is actually going, and we want employees to look there. Uh, if it's a bad email, it usually has a weird-looking link, and don't click on it. We have a lot of tips. We're not going to do the training here today, but um, there's a lot of stuff out there. People just need to be careful. If you don't expect the email, you know, be cautious of it. We, uh, in 2017, we entered an agreement with a company to help us provide some training. So they also do testing to see where we're at. In uh, September 2017, we ran the test, and we found that 27% of the county employees that received it, which was almost all the county employees, they clicked the link. Could have been a, a bad situation. Um, and we were actually below what was the average, what they expected. So they, they were happy about that. But then we did the training in November. 97% of the county employees participated in the training. We have documentation on that. It was an online training, teaching them how to detect phishing emails, so forth. So in March, we re-ran the test, and only 4.4%. It went back up to 76 but then it dipped down quite a bit in December in 2018, and then the first part of uh, 2019. Our problem is, in September 2019, we see it going back up a little bit, and it could be a variety of reasons, so we're looking at that. You know, we'll probably add some more training. We'll look at the details of what they clicked on. Uh, the good part of it is when they do click on it, um, they get a little embarrassing message on their screen that says, you know, they didn't pass the test. We don't call them out. We don't notify their supervisors. We, want, we don't want the county employees to be scared. But it's, it's somewhat of a training as we go, which is why the numbers went down. We're not sure why it went up this last time. Uh, we're still looking into that. Um, just a quick, we did a training the other day. This was a bunch of different slides, so I kind of combined it into one. We tell employees to be suspicious of all emails, especially unexpected, those especially during the holiday season. You get a lot of deals out there. We did catch a lot of people with uh, Starbucks deals. It's a fake email that says you can get a free cup of coffee, and they clicked on the link. Um, be suspicious of all those emails. Check for misspellings, bad grammar. Um, generic readings are suspicious. You hover over the links. Uh, call to verify. If you get emails from your banks, 
that ask you to change your password or do something, call the bank, ask them if it's real, or go to the bank's website directly. Don't click on the link in the email. Um, use good passwords. Uh, Multi-factor authentication, I'll talk about that in another slide. USB keys, if you, somebody hands you a USB key, don't trust it. Those are very dangerous, those USB keys, and we're gonna do some more testing with county employees on that. Um, you have to, it has to be from a trusted source. Um, those keys can get on your computer, can automatically run a program. Uh, we don't want those on the county network. You shouldn't use them at home either. Um, only use trusted computers as county employees travel. We ask them to stick with their county issued notebook if they have one, if they're using a hotel computer or something. There are some safe browsing techniques you can do. There's, you don't just go into Internet Explorer. There's a, some options in there to choose safe browsing, and we can send out information on that. Always back up your data. This never works. Everybody laughs at it. Give up social media, right? Don't use it. It's, it's really bad. There's a lot of viruses. But that's never going to happen. So uh, limit your use and personal information. We showed a video at a previous, another training I did last week, where it showed a coffee shop, said, like us on Facebook. And people would like them on Facebook. You get a free cup of coffee. So while they did that, they had people in the back. Once they got their social media profile, they went and looked up all the information they could find. And within a couple of minutes, they knew about all their relatives, where they worked, where they banked. They wrote it on the cup and handed it to them and shocked the people. So social media can be a very dangerous thing to use. Changes happening in the county. There'll be some changes coming up here at the, really it'll go full force at the beginning of the year. Um, we will start limiting access to our email system. Right now we use a G Suite. Um, anybody can access from anywhere. So for the employees that need that kind of access, they'll get some additional training. But for employees that don't need it, the least access, we'll be able to now limit it so they can only log in from certain areas, basically county facilities. Multi-factor authentication, some people think it's a pain, but you probably have used it with your banks. Um, you go, you try to sign in, and they send you a code somehow to, so you can really get into it. That's the multi-factor. We're gonna start implementing that in the county, so if you sign in on your, your email, your county computer, you'll have to have another method to sign on. It can be a pain, some people complain about it, but we have enough input from other cities and counties that um, once they got hit with ransomware, nobody complained after that. So we'd rather try to get that before we get hit with this ransomware. Uh, we are gonna try to add something nice, we hope, for the employees, which is a single sign-on system. So it's a company we can use to help manage passwords. People, can, uh, employees complain that they just have too many passwords. They might have 10 different applications they have to sign into, and that's 10 different passwords. They all have different complexities. So we've been testing a system, and we think we're pretty close. It'll allow people to um, use one username, one password to sign into most of the things that they do. And then we will continue on with more training, of course. So that is all I had, unless anybody had any questions. Any questions, gentlemen? You have a backup system to the cloud, and do you also have a backup system uh, for a hard drive, for example, uh, in the system? So basically you have multiple backup systems so that if one gets attacked, at least you have others? Yes, we, so we, we back up which you would say locally. So yes, we have hard drives or servers or devices uh, around the county that we back up to. So say if you're here at the Flint Center, your data doesn't get backed up to the Flint Center, it gets backed up somewhere else remotely, but it is within county. And then at night, all that data gets sent to the cloud as another redundant source. Is the cloud really secure? So we use government approved sites for it. The cloud is, uh, is technically just hard drive somewhere else. So, you know, people think of the cloud and where that really is. So we use um, uh, vendors that everybody knows about. I mean, they're, they're common vendors are out there. There's a few of them that do this, and um, it, they're approved by DOJ, and they're approved by government entities for government sites. So one thing about government is they're very specific. To get approved, the data cannot leave the United States. And that's not the case if you were to use Google in general or you use a lot of these services. The data can go anywhere, wherever they decide to take you, and they have the reasons. So the government data is kept in the United States, but it is approved. And it's safe based on the passwords we use and the type of encryption we use. So. Okay, thanks. Dan, uh, thank you for that enlightening report. Uh, it's a little foreboding, I'm afraid. 
it sounds like uh, ransomware is not anywhere near being controlled, and it's this industry, this illegal industry, this unlawful industry is growing. Is that uh, your assessment of the problem? It's, yeah, I think it's growing or else people are just reporting it more, but um, it's definitely growing. So it's not a case of if, it's, it's when Del Norte County is going to be hit. It's not yeah, if, it's yes. when. That, that is what they're saying. It's be prepared for when it hits. So what's happening on the uh, enforcement level? Are, there, are they making any arrests and convictions of people who practice this illegal form of Yeah, I, I've heard business? of very, very few. It's usually overseas, and it's dealing with the other countries and trying to get them. Um, so it's not an American-generated criminal. It's someone who's elsewhere. It can be, but typically it is not. Yeah. Um, we have the sources of if we were to hit, we can call and we can use the FBI. If we pay ransomware, we're required to report that. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to pay it and be quiet. Um, so if we needed assistance from the FBI, we can use that, and most cities do. So nice. continued vigilance, as far as you're concerned, is the only answer to uh, lower the odds of Delnor County being hit and then of, yes. uh, impacted which would be, we don't have a lot of money anyway, but again, yeah. if, it, if it freezes our system, so it's just a vigilance issue, is that right? Yes, it's something, we've always dealt with viruses, it's always, everybody knew you had to get virus protection, and people kind of lost track of that, but those systems got to be pretty good, virus protection and these firewalls that we use, they're actually pretty good at blocking this stuff now. So the criminals had to find another way, and the way they found was basically these phishing emails, or go in and figure out the, figure out where the weak link is, which they believe is so many employees with so many usernames and passwords and so much trouble for them keeping track of it that um, that's where the attacks are coming now. And it'll change in the future. I'm sure we'll f they'll come up with some solution for it, but it's, it's a huge risk right now, and um, yeah, it's where our concentration is. So are you is. saying that we're going to have more password uh, obstacles as we go through when we use our computers at the county? I think we have two now. And when I want to get on my computer, I have yeah. to get in and then yeah. use another one. And that yeah. they should be different uh, passwords. Is that what you're saying? Is a no, we're going to we're gonna clean some of those things up. So you have two, but if you work at Health and Human Services, you might have ten, mm. um, depending on what systems there are. And that's, that's true. It might even be more, actually. So we are going to install a system that's going to allow you to use a single username and password, especially for the ones you're talking about. Those will definitely sync into one username, one password. However... We will add that multi-factor method. So when you go to sign in, something will have to be done, whether it's on your phone or a different method. You'll have to have another way to authenticate yourself. And we'll, everybody will get training on that. It won't be, it'll be phased in over some time. Um, so we'll try to correct that. We use industry standard methods for trying to combat this issue. But yes, we do believe we will get hit sometime, and we just hope that we're prepared and able to recover as quickly as possible. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, Dan, thanks. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, I know Imperial County got hit with a ransomware, and they had insurance. And I think there were, they were being asked for $2 million, and they decided not to pay it. They had $2 million. I don't remember what they were being asked for, but they had $2 million in insurance. And at, at uh, the last report that I'd heard from the supervisor at an RCRC meeting was they were, had been down for three weeks and they were over a million dollars in recovering and hadn't gotten there yet. And mm -hmm. do we have insurance? I believe we do. I've seen it. I've seen the lines in the budget. It's, and I, it goes through uh, HR, but I've seen cybersecurity insurance. So I don't know what the policy limits are on how that would work. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a tricky situation, right? Because if nobody would pay, then there wouldn't be this issue. Right. Um, but they're paying, and they're paying a lot. Yeah. Well, I know some people are negotiating and getting it down when they find out that they're dealing with a small county and they don't have any money. They, they yeah. negotiate down. I've heard, I've heard those things too. So what is it about emails? Just by opening the email, is, is that a threat? If you, just, if you have an email there yeah. and, and it just as, as you're scrolling through them and they come up, or do you actually have to do something within the email? The, the bigger issue is clicking on the link. Opening the email is typically, and I'll just say typically because I don't know, you know right. what they're coming up with next. Typically, just opening the email and looking at it, you're going to be safe. Okay. Once you click on the link, then you kind of open yourself up. And just clicking on it can cause some issues. 
and we've tested that with our with the company that we use and they they do it as a test they send stuff so opening that link the other thing that a lot of times happens is you click on something and then they come up with a page that looks like a Google sign-on page but if you were to look at the your browser settings you would see that you're not really on Google but the page looks so good that you go ahead and type in your username and password so what you've just done is give them your username and, and password. password that's happened to the county quite a bit yeah. we've gotten stuck with that one the multi-factor authentication would help with that so even if the other side has your username and password it wouldn't be able to get back to the network because they would have to have that second ability yep thanks I yes. yeah nice to know that we're getting backed up thank you for putting your time together and showing right. us this it's very it was very informative thank you right. okay moving on to item 24 how are you today Fabulous, as always. all righty Barbara Lopez, Del Mar County Treasurer. This is my treasurer's report for quarter ending September 30th, 2018. So um, we ended with our portfolio total of $43,013,943. Um, our CDs stayed pretty much the same at $10,290,000. Our agency um, investments are about 41% of the portfolio, which is just shy of $18 million. Um, our mitigation fund is uh, holding steady at $2.6 million. Our Caltrust general fund account is at $500,000, which it's been out for a while. But happily, I'd like to report that LAFE, our local agency investment liquid account, is back to a safe balance of $11.5 million. So, um, because LAIF has been pretty low, I haven't been comfortable doing investments for the last few quarters, um, but we're back up into a safe balance, so I'm happy to start purchasing. Probably five-year bullets and five-year CDs are best just with the market right now. Um, and we did get a Series E um, bond, the school district Series E bond funded in October for 4.8, and the school district is um, happy to let me invest that for anywhere from three to five years, and they don't need it right away is what Jeff Harris was telling me, so I will be working on that as well. Interest earnings for this quarter were great, 286000 so we'll continue to see that. A lot of the higher rated bonds that I purchased over the last few years will still get the money coming in, um, but we might see, you know, in the next couple of years that go down just a little bit because rates have dropped, so it's based on what I buy is what our interest earnings are going to be. But we'll take it when we have it. <laughs> um, interest rates are a little bit lower than what this um, sheet says. Right now, I can probably pick up a five-year bullet at about 185. Um, CDs are, are right about the same. Um, I just purchased a bullet CD for 185. But LAIF, happily, is doing really well, 2.28 as of September. And then Caltrust is pretty good too at 1.78%. Um, so we'll just, you know, kind of try to pick up things that are the highest rated yield I can get without too much call um, on it and try to get those bullets. And, you know, I don't want to chase yield by any means, but when the rates are low, it's nice to get a couple extra basis points if I can. Um, so our investment activity was really low. We had, um, I did purchase a CD, or a CD for 1.9% for three year bullet, which is actually pretty good. And that was just swapping out a called um, CD at 230, which isn't a horrible change in value, but um, I did want to roll that in. We had a couple maturities, which is great. Get those off the books. Those were pretty low, 1.2%. And then we did have a call um, of a 2.75 um, agency bond. But we did need the cash for this last quarter, so it was good to see those uh, maturities that helped get that life balance up. So our cash flow, July was ugly, but that's always, you know, summertime's always pretty bad, but the rest of the quarter looked really good, actually. Um, my projected cash flow for this coming quarter that we're in now, October's gonna be way off. I didn't want to include the school bond money just because that's sort of an anomaly in it, but um, we have our, you know, property tax payments coming in, and like I said, right now, LAFE is pretty high, so I'll be purchasing some extra things this coming quarter. 
And that's what I got for you. Great, thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Any, Any questions? questions or comments? All right. Margo, thank you very thank much. Thank you Have so much. Okay, moving on to item 25, presentation and direction to staff regarding cannabis retail distance from local juvenile hall facility. Good morning, Joel. Good morning, board. Um, this is an issue that has been coming up in public comment for a while, but we have not addressed it until today. Um, the state law says that a retail operation can't be licensed within 600 feet of a school unless the local jurisdiction specifies a different radius. Um, back during the working group days, um, that was not uh, something that um, there was much interest in, either here or with the working group, of reducing inside of that state um, minimum. This map here, um, if you can see, up in the corner, top left corner, is Sticky Grove. And then that white building down on the bottom right is the juvenile hall. Are the yellow lines your um, parcel lines? Yes. Okay. So state law says that the distance is measured from parcel line to parcel line. So because the juvenile hall is on a big wide parcel, um, that shorter red line over on the left is the current measurement. It's about 450 feet inside the 600. Um, it's actually about 1,100 square feet to the actual juvenile hall building. How long? I'm sorry? How far? 11? About 1,100. Um, so at the time that um, Robert Rico got the permit back in February, um, it was just really not on anybody's mind that there might be a school in there. Um, I don't think that's probably what the state meant when they mentioned schools. It is a, a penal institution. Um, but in looking at what a school is, the definition of a school, I think probably if Robert Dorigo's permit came up for renewal, staff would recommend denial because it is a school within 600 feet. So that leaves us a couple of questions. One is, does the board want staff to try to fix it so that Robert doesn't have to move? And if so, how? Um, if we split this lot in half, then we'd measure with that second red line, which is well over 600 feet. So nothing has to change in any of our ordinances. We would just split that lot in half. Another way to do it would be to uh, either change, reduce the setback from a school for all um, retailers um, down to, say, 400 or 450 feet. Uh, and that would open up at all schools. Or we can try to finesse something in our code so that only this school is treated differently. You know, a separate setback for the hall or try to try to wiggle the definition of what a school is for purposes of our county code and hope that the state kind of recognizes that and goes along with it when they issue their permit. So um, I guess the first question is, does the board want us to do anything? Gentlemen, any questions? Yeah, I, I do have a question. I, I guess I did not realize that it was from parcel line to parcel line. Uh, I mean, that that could make it, um, I mean, that makes it pretty sticky. So the facility, <laughs> that wasn't intended, actually. <laughs> you know, usually I'm better at that, and I would say that was uh, unintended, uh, or I mean a, an intended pun. But, um, how how come we don't go from facility to facility rather than rather than property line? Is it's there... what the state law says. Um, it it actually makes sense. It could be a lot more difficult to measure from facility to facility or decide kind of what the perimeter is, where the parking lot is, what the relevant kind of boundaries are. This is just certain. We know legally where the property lines are. Yeah. Now, state law does say um, it's property line to property line unless otherwise specified by law. It doesn't say what that law is. It kind of applies by other state law somewhere. But if we wanted to kind of squint at it and say, well, our county code provides a different measurement system, we can look at that. The problem is then what is our new measurement system? Right. And what unintended consequences would come from it being building to building or something like that? This just is very easy to administrate well on one hand it's easier but yeah you know if you have a 
elongated piece of property you could yeah um there's always kind of a tension between what's certain and what's fair yeah what's fair you know is often hard to pin down on a general rule so it's kind of a compromise any other questions so joel um the distance isn't a, necessarily a straight line from juvenile hall i'm looking at your map right here to 1071 highway 101 north is is it's it's measured on a different criterion it's measured in a straight line you know as the crow straight? flies and what is that distance again from 1071 so to? the left line there is the shortest distance that is about 450. so this technically if juvenile hall is in fact considered a school and that what i'm hearing you from you it is it is a school k through it's got education teachers it's cert certified it, yeah it so is. this the current location um at present time of 1071 is in violation of the current code allowing its existence to be there in relationship to the juvenile hall facility is that what i'm hearing you say yeah okay so what about the other side of the street as you go toward the church i'm going over on uh across the road there uh, um, are there any as if we as we look to the west from 1071 going in a westerly fashion um are there any other violations of i know there's the church there and i think that has a school in it also i don't know i it was not my understanding that it had a school in it um but churches while they are sensitive uses there's not a hard setback there's a finding the planning commission makes that it doesn't negatively affect the sensitive use and that gives that church an opportunity to show up and say hey we're a church don't let this happen near us um, but that as far as i know i wasn't at the planning commission when this was approved but so I don't the believe rules, there's any are the rules different for churches versus schools yes, okay. yes. schools have a hard setback okay so in this case the school um what are you asking our board to do uh, amend the current restriction allowing the facility to exist uh 1071 to exist in its current situs uh or are you saying that uh, he should move or we should make a decision on his moving uh, what i'm asking is if the board wants to try to allow him to stay Mm -hmm. If the board says no, uh, find another location. And just the last time the board gave direction, it was to reduce it to 600 feet for schools and, and reduce the setback between locations. So we may have opened up more spots for him to move to. I'm not sure. Um, but if the board wants to allow Robert to stay in that location, um, then the next question is how. It's either a lot split or we change some definitions. We've had a similar conversation on the discussion on Smith River and the Smith River School in relationship to its uh, potential sites. Uh, I thought that was a thousand feet, and the board was considering it lowering it to 600. Uh, is that correct? The board gave direction last time I was here, which may have been the last meeting, yes. um, to reduce it from a thousand to 600. Okay. Yes. Um, the Smith River below, School. This though, is below the 600 threshold. Right. It is. And so, you know, this was approved by the Planning Commission. Uh, he started a business. So he has relied on a land use permission we gave him. So we can't take it back from him, even though it's in violation, which is kind of why this was not treated as a huge urgency item to begin with, is he's got his year either way. The question is, when he goes back to the Planning Commission in February, is staff going to recommend denial based on the school, or are we going to try to work something in the code to allow him to continue in that location what is the expiration of that year what date is that it's february okay. something or other but he'll have to apply probably in early january or something okay thank you i'm concerned about the definition of a school you know the juvenile hall facility is basically a locked up facility students don't have the ability to come and go right uh you know, it's mainly a the juvenile detention center, and the school seems to be secondary. So why are we classifying this as a school instead of a juvenile detention facility? Um, so that's the reason why we didn't even notice that we had this siting problem in the first place, because nobody was thinking of this as a school. Um, but when you look at the definition of school in the business professions code regarding the cannabis, it just says a school providing K through 12 education. 
And then if you kind of poke around other places in the Welfare and Institutions Code where it says, we talked about juvenile halls, it specifically says the Board of Supervisors may establish a school within the juvenile hall. Um, and then the Board of Education, I believe, is running this school. It has a teacher. It, it really functionally is a school. It just isn't, I think, what anybody intended when they passed that law. So, um, you know, one thing maybe we do is say for the purpose of the county code, a school contained in a detention facility is not a school or something like that. Um, you know, it, it is a good distance. I don't think that, um, I don't think that there's a negative impact that anybody's complaining about. Um, so I think it's up to the board. If you want us to try to keep it there, we either need to split that lot or, or, or kind of play with the county code. You know, Joel, I, I see Lonnie Raymond is here from probation. I don't want to put Lonnie on the spot, but I, I'd like his intake well. um, on him coming forward and rendering his opinion on the, 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 this, the existence of his school and is it secure? Are any young people, youth walking back and forth then? Because we've had the similar discussion before. So I'd, I'd appreciate, uh, Lonnie, if you didn't mind coming in and giving us your, your thoughts on that. Good morning, uh, Lonnie Raymond, Chief Probation Officer. So if I understand the issue at hand, the question is whether there is a school? Is that what you're looking for, Supervisor Gill? No, Gillen? we know there's a school, okay. but is there any present and clear danger to kids being subjected to the cannabis product as a result of walking into and out of? Is it secure? No. Are there kids walking around because uh, uh, the, the as Williams drives, meanders is through. Or right. What's what's the status? Is there any risk here? Um, I would wager that there's no more risk with Sticky Grove being in that location than Y Liquors being in the location it's currently at. Um, so no. As far as um, my department is concerned and the kids that we serve, I don't believe this raises any risk level for us. Thanks, Lonnie. Any other? Questions from the board? Any other comments? So, Joel, you need direction from us, correct? I just feel we have a business who is functioning, who is bringing taxes into the community. I don't believe any of us thought of this as a school, even though we all know it is a school in there, or it is trying to function as a school. Um, you know, I'd say split the lot or I, I don't want to I pers you know, I don't want to go down any further than the state. I think we're, you know, I don't want to open up that. Um, I hear from you saying that there's two options. We can either split the parcel, which isn't too big of a deal or change your code a little bit. What do you most feel comfortable with? Well, um, if we split the lot, then we aren't reducing that situation for any other uh, sites so no other school will be affected and no other retail or possible le retail would be close than 600 feet so as far as addressing this very specific situation I think splitting the lot is a good way to do it um, we could also play with the county code it's a little less elegant a solution and it, it puts us in a position where we're going below what the state says and while I have reached out to the state and though it sounds like I think they're okay with it. They'll kind of get the application. Um, you know, Robert would have to check the box on the application that says, no, I'm not more than 600 feet from a school. And then they'll go through some kind of process to verify that we really have approved it. But I think it should work. No, no promises that the state's gonna go for, but I think it should work. But splitting the lot is, is clean and easy. It's just also, you know, that's a piece of county property. I don't know what its future uses might be. I don't know the... Uh, Kind of the risks or benefits of splitting a lot. I don't think there should be many, but. I, I guess, I guess I'm wondering about the process of splitting the lot. And I mean, we certainly can't put it in somebody else's name. I don't think it's ours, but um, does that, does that decrease any funding opportunities that we might have for the rest of the properties or uh, would we be changing anything, Jay, that you're aware of? 
No, I don't think so. Okay. I, I don't think that it's going to have an effect on any type of grants. You just have to have land tenure. So what is the pleasure of the board? Draw a line? I don't. Um, I was going to retain my comments so after we heard from the public. I know there's probably people here that wanted okay. to speak to it, so I want to definitely hear from the public first. Okay. If I can point out one thing, if we, if the board wants to split the lots, we'll be back for the board to do it. So this won't be the last to hear from it. If, right. Either way, if you want us to save Robert's spot, this won't be the last that you have to act on it. Thanks. Any public comment on item number 25? You know, uh, Robert, here we go again. I would just like to reiterate that, uh, um, you know, we had seen the McCarthy School exist. McCarthy School ceased to exist. No, it does exist. I want to clarify that. It's over at the school district now in Harding. So it was right there. I think you got confused on those two. So Elk Creek is... Right, but at that cannabis work group, um, uh, you know, we, we were told that that, that, that school's no longer there. That's right. what Heidi Kunstai said. Yeah. Right, and so it, it came off the map. There was no school present when I would begin to search, you know, as there was before McCarthy School. Um, so when I applied, I said, no, I'm not near a school, you know, based on, you know, evidence from the county itself um, via the maps that they prepared. Um, thank you anyways for your time. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Hello. Hi. I'm glad my point has come to the address, the board. Robert, I have nothing personal against you. I'd just like to say that. What I'd like to say too is my pre-existing business is over 3,600 feet from a public school where children come and go. The church where they're saying is a discrepancy is a closed campus, just like the juvenile hall. Less than seven students attend that facility. They don't come in and go back and forward. As far as the juvenile hall, there is attending members that visit those students. Who knows their ages? We don't. Might be underage, maybe not. If one is good for, if it's good for one to make an amendment, for distance in a closed campus, it should be good for the other one too. First should be fair, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are you sure you wanna violate state law and set a precedence by looking for loopholes? Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on item 25? Yeah, bring back the board. Sticky situation, yeah, I think you said it right there, Jerry. Um, yeah, absolutely, nobody, nobody contemplated juvenile hall being considered as a school versus a detention facility, and now we're left with a problem to solve. And um, having gone through many boundary adjustments, lot line adjustments, uh, parcel splits in my time that seems like the easiest method to solve this issue if the board's willing to solve it um, I don't see tampering potentially with language um, defining a school and what's not a school is a is a is maybe the appropriate way at this time might be a little bit more lengthy but at least uh, the boundary adjustment piece seems like a logical way I do think the the pieces that will come back to us as far as distance, whether we're setting a state standard at um, 600 feet versus maybe reducing that to 500 feet, I think that will still come back before us when Joel has time to address it with the board. But I, I do want to still address that with with the board here in, in the near future meeting, but I don't know if it's going to be soon enough for what, uh, for Mr. Rigo's business in in February and when this comes back before the Planning Commission for approval. Um, I guess my initial thoughts are, to, are more leaning to that lot split and it's kind of where I'm 
I'm hedging right now, unless I could be convinced otherwise by the board. Supervisor Berkowitz. That seems to be the most workable and logical solution to me. All right, Supervisor Hemington, Supervisor Gitlin. Joel, would you come on back here and go over the lot split option again? Uh, I kind of agree a little bit with Linda Sutter's comment about this loophole exemption, and I want to see what the purpose of the lot split, how it would satisfy this matter. Well, so I would actually think of this not as the loophole option. The loophole option would be reducing it below the state. 600 feet this will keep the 600 feet but we'll just split the lot right down the middle so when you measure you use this red line and it's just a, a longer line this is more than 600 feet so if we keep the 600 feet and actually we'll be reducing it from the current thousand to 600 feet for the board's last direction um, you know we're fully in compliance with the state's minimum normal default 600 feet we've just removed all of this property that really has no functional relationship to the juvenile hall anyway well despite my personal feelings about this product and its impact on del Norte county i i do understand that this is an ongoing business and it's a legal business now it's not a, my opinion on it anymore it's the law so i would support the lot split I think you have consensus. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to item number 26. We're going to adjourn as the Board of Supervisors and reconvene as the Board of Equalization and approve and adopt the Board of Equalization local rules as requested by County Council. So, um, there are um, there's an assessment appeals manual and um, it addresses certain things as does the revenue and taxation code um, the assessment manual is appeals manual is like a simplified version of the property tax rules and the revenue and taxation code um, and as the board of equalization um, you will be familiar with or you have been familiar with the assessment appeals manual however it doesn't address everything so um, there are there is room and the california constitution allows for um, uh, boards of equalization assessment appeal boards to create their own local rules um, and they address things such as noticing um, addressing things such as findings of fact um, and uh, how hearings will be noticed and um, a variety of other things kind of intrinsic to the county's process um, because you are acting as the board of equalization um, and Del Norte County is smaller doesn't have an assessment appeals board um, there are particularized things um, kind of simplified for Del Norte County looking at other assessment appeal board um, local rules this has been kind of an ongoing project for our office um, as we look at code reforms some policy reforms and this was one of the many things that you know was kind of a back burner to do list item for the past several years um, and so um, this basically gives um, more direction to applicants and to the board as well um, going through the assessment appeals process um, and allows um, for some more clarity in those situations more efficiency um, in those situations so if you have any questions about it um, let me know um, uh, we've gone through a process of meeting several times with the assessor um, as well as clerk of the board to make sure this works for both of those offices um, and believe that um, that it will make things more efficient move to approve and adopt the board of equalization local rules a motion to have a second had second that motion any public comment on item 26 see none Kylie supervisor Berkowitz yes supervisor Gitlin <coughs> yes supervisor Howard yes supervisor Hemmingson yes chair Cowan yes 
Okay, item 27, we're going to approve and authorize the waiver to extend hearing on application for changed assessment for APN 118-410-001, that's Safeway, in accordance to Revenue and Taxation Code. Uh, code and property tax rule. Um, so I can talk about this one too, yeah, if you like. Um, so uh, according to the code, um, the hearings must be done within two years. Um, in this particular situation, um, Safeway, as well as the assessor, agreed to extend out um, that deadline to allow for the hearing. Otherwise, it would have to happen um, this month over the Thanksgiving holiday, and I believe they are in um, additional talks. Um, and so this would simply allow um, for that hearing, that two-year date to be extended. Okay. Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and second. Do I have any public comment on item number 27? Seeing none, Kylie? Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Chair Cowan? Yes. Okay, moving on to item 28. We're going to approve and authorize the chair to sign the stipulation agreement with Benita C. Maplesenden, APN 106-151-012, as requested by the assessor. Are you... Oh, are you sitting over there? Hi, good morning. Good morning, how are we doing? Good. Good. Brantley Cobb, assistant assessor. So yeah, we're here for stipulation between Mapleson and the assessor's... County of Del Norte, um, the value we're agreeing on is 55,000. Originally we came in around uh, at 60,000, so it's a $5,000 difference there in assessed value. If you have any questions on our valuation there. So Brantley, it's just a difference of 5,000? Yeah, so the original appeal application, let me go back there. I think she wrote on there 117, 300. We originally had a higher, a uh, lot higher value on the property. She uh, spoke with us. We reviewed the property. This is a, it is buildable, but needs to be developed. It's wetland mark. I mean, it's swamp, swampy. You know, uh, originally on our first assessment, we didn't uh, take that into consideration. Our appraiser didn't, and we re-looked at it, came in at 60, and she still didn't agree with that value. She wanted it 55. After more comparables came in and more information, we agreed at the 55. Motion to approve the stipulation agreement with Benita C. Mapleston, as requested by the assessor's office. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any public comment on item number 28? Thank you. Thank you, Brantley. Seeing none, Kylie, can you pull the vote? Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Chair Cowan? Yes. Moving on to item 29, adjourn. We're going to adjourn as the Board of Equalization and reconvene as the Board of Supervisors and do a few things. One, approve and adopt a resolution approving the agreement to purchase tax defaulted property for the sale of the assessor's parcel numbers listed on the attachment. And two, an uh, approve and authorize the chair and county administrative officer to sign the agreement to purchase tax defaulted property as requested by the CAO. Jay? These lots were or are located in the Pacific Shore subdivision and are subject to tax sale after the first of the year. We were approached through the Wildlife Conservation Board, which is a funding and acquisition arm of the Department of Fish and Wildlife, to uh, go through the process of a chapter 8 sale which is to purchase those lots through the treasurer tax collector or from the treasurer tax collector and then have those available for sale to the wildlife conservation board for acquisition for public purpose and these steps are required under the government code um, had multiple discussions with the treasurer tax collector on process as well as with uh, uh, the wildlife conservation Conservation Board staff and uh, Supervisor Hemmingson has been involved in this from the beginning also. Um, number of steps to go through. Ultimately, um, the county would then resell those to the Wildlife Conservation Board at whatever the appraised value is at the time. Any public, I'm going to take public comment on item 29 at this time. Any public comment on item 29? 
Yeah. Madam Chairman, uh, I would move that we approve and adopt the resolution um, and approve and authorize the chair and the county administrator to sign the amendment purchase default properties. All right. Second that motion. The motion and a second. I didn't see any public comment. Kylie? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Cowan? Yes. That brings us to item 30. I'm going to recuse myself and send it over to Chair Hemmingson. Thank you. Moving on to uh, item number 30, uh, consider a request. Uh, submitted by the Crescent City Delmark Chamber of Commerce uh, for one-time funding for the Crescent City Delmark Chamber of Commerce Visitors Bureau to hire a consultant to maximize the community's marketing and exposure associated with the Sister City 2020 Olympic coverage and two, to adopt uh, budget transfer 11-07 uh, redirecting $10,000 previously budgeted for economic development uh, purposes to revenue and expenditure lines within the Office of Administration for transfer to the Chamber of Commerce for the requested marketing and exposure strategy. You want to start, Jay? Sure. Um, I see Ms. Vosberg is here, so she probably will expand a lot on this, but the request came in from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we placed it on for the consideration of the board and uh, taken the opportunity, put the step on, um, to do the budget transfer now because we don't have another meeting until the middle of December. So um, at this point, uh, I'll just turn it over to Ms. Vosberg to give you all the details of what their request is. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here. My name is Cindy Vosberg. I'm the Crescent City Del Norte Chamber of Commerce Director. And I'd like to introduce to you Rob Homeland with Malex Consulting. Rob is somebody that's come to us um, as highly recommended. He's currently working with the city on the project and has worked in the past with the harbor on a project and has a lot of experience. And I'm going to ask Rob to go over the details. But can I ask how much time do we have? Um. OK, thank you, Roger. Rob? Uh, excuse me, I, I'm running the show oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, here. Uh, How much time do we have, Jerry? Um, well, you know, we like to keep these things around 10 minutes or so. If you go longer than that, we're going to end up. So our meeting's already running behind, so we're running this out. So, uh, yeah, I, I'd like to keep it around 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Board of Supervisors. My name is Rob Holmland. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. Um, so, I've got a presentation up here. And I'm with uh, Malix Consulting. I'll explain the name in a moment. And here to talk, uh, because I've been invited, uh, I've been asked to talk about strategies uh, to seize opportunities associated with the 2020 Olympics. And there's a broad coalition of partners um, involved in this up to this point, and I imagine the coalition to grow substantially uh, in the coming weeks. It's so a little bit of context. Uh, you know this story better than I do, and uh, this book here I imagine all of you are familiar with, and uh, I've been reading this to my kids the uh, past couple of weeks. So the story um, I don't think we need to dwell on, and given that we have 10 minutes, um, just say more or less uh, an, an amazing experience happened with the cities of Crescent City and uh, Rakuza Takeda. And the the power of that story is capturing international attention and uh, NBC Sports is uh, doing a documentary associated with the Olympics and the opportunity to get Crescent City and Dorn Del Norte County in front of the world um, for the benefit of your economic development is something that's not going to come around all that often. So one question you should be asking is who is this guy and why is he, who, who is Rob and, and why is he involved in this? So uh, I moved here from Maryland uh, in uh, 2003 to go to Humboldt State University and immediately upon getting here knew that this is where I was going to live for the rest of my life. Met my wife, we got married, had kids, uh, and I began working for the Karuk tribe while I was in graduate school. And then I uh, moved over to Winsler & Kelly Consulting Engineers. Uh, it was an engineering firm with about 300 people all over the west coast of the United States. Uh, and then that company merged into GHD, which is a global engineering firm. 
And so the picture on the bottom right there is me at Pacific Shores and was involved in the decommissioning of all the roads there after that was all decided. So worked for the, uh, the airport, um, also did projects for the Harbor District and the city. Uh, and so over the course of 10 years between Winsler and Kelly and GHD, I did a number of projects up here. And then uh, the city of Eureka was one of my clients. And so when the uh, community development, economic development director position uh, came up, they asked me to apply, which I did. Uh, long story, ultimately accepted the position and um, made it pretty clear that um, my whole career up to that point had been in the private sector, wasn't really a government guy. And so uh, I had no intention of staying forever, but uh, dedicated five years to the community development, economic development department of the city of Eureka. And, had a great time there, really glad that I did that, and then uh, left just a couple of months ago to form Malix Consulting. So here's my team. I'm the principal. Uh, my wife is my chief advisor. Um, these are my chief strategist, strategist and visionaries. And the name Malix Consulting comes from Max and Alex, uh, their names. And so uh, Malix Consulting. Oh. I don't know how that happened. Okay, so what I do is site development, government, community relations and facilitation, planning, building, construction processes, economic development, leadership coaching, and project management. I do not do marketing, branding, or public relations. And really what this project before you is, is a marketing, branding, and public relations project. So why am I here? Well, in a conversation with the city manager and uh, the, your director of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, they asked me to put together a scope. Um, I'm working on the city's economic development strategic plan with Plan West Partners. And uh, in a kind of side conversation, just coincidentally, um, I was asked, you know, what do you think we could do for this Olympics uh, thing? So I put together just a number of ideas and sent it to them. And uh, they said, hey, this is great. Let's expand on this. And so I talked to some uh, public relations firms that I know and marketing specialists and came up with the scope that's before you. Um, without the intention of me being the one to do it, I just said, here's some ideas I've had, I've consulted, I've, you know, I know how to come up with scopes like this. And uh, your director of Chamber of Commerce asked me to lead the team. And so I'm here before you because mostly of my project management skills. So I've managed projects all over the world, some big projects, uh, and it comes down to understanding the specialist you're working with and the objectives you're trying to accomplish and then making sure that the team delivers on the objectives. And so project management really comes to assisting with uh, conceptualization and visioning of the project, developing a strategy to complete it, uh, recruiting the specialists to complete the, the, the team or the work, um, create and oversee step-by-step -step process, managing the schedule, and then uh, managing revenues and expenses. So. Now that you understand the context and who I am, let's talk about the broad project objectives that we've come up with so far. So increase tourism to Crescent City and Del Norte County. Empower women and youth, stimulate economic growth, uh, grow, grow community pride, and bring public awareness to tsunami hazards and preparedness, tsunami preparedness. These broad project objectives will definitely grow over time, but you also don't have a lot of time. The coalition uh, from Japan is coming in mid-December, as is NBC Sports. The clock is ticking. You don't have a lot of time to execute all of this. So we have to come up with what our objectives are very soon. Some other specific project objectives that I've thrown out there are to make Rakuza Takeda proud of the relationship with Crescent City and to make them feel like international heroes. Um, they are also having the, the spotlight shined on them internationally. And so the relationship between Crescent City and Rakuza Takeda is the story. And so the more you can bolster them, the better it will be for them. And that relationship will pay off. Uh, maximize this opportunity to capture national and international attention resulting from NBC Sports highlight of the sister city relationship by providing excellent resources and experiences to the NBC Sports production crew. Attract additional media attention, especially through earned media. So an example, a definition of earned media is uh, really advertisement that you don't pay for. So a New York Times ad, one page ad, for instance, could cost $10,000. You are paying the New York Times to put whatever information you want on one full piece of paper. Or you can make a relationship with a journalist, tell them a compelling story, they write a story, takes up a full page, you've gotten exactly the same amount of exposure and exactly the same newspaper for no money. You've earned that media instead of paid for it. So this is an opportunity. The, what, what's happening with NBC Sports is earned media. Can you double down on that and get Fox Sports to come? Can you get uh, MSNBC to come? Can you get the San Francisco Chronicle to cover this? 
Also opportunities here to build youth and women empowerment to every aspect of the project. As you know, Rakuza Takata is working to have a city built around empowerment of women and uh, youth. And so something that you could build upon. Create and enhance promotional materials for ongoing post-Olympics marketing. What you produce through this process in the coming months you could utilize for years. Uh, generate materials that will be useful for years beyond the event. Uh, and so here's the scope. One is to establish a coalition and then facilitate and manage. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people uh, involved in this. Also, feel free to interrupt me throughout this. Um, don't, don't wait to ask questions if you'd like, um, if you need clarification. Step two is a facilitated full coalition half-day workshop. As soon as possible, we should get together everyone that's involved in this in any way and identify uh, what everyone is doing, what everyone thinks should be done, and then form mini teams with team leaders um, to uh, make sure that everyone's communicating with each other, everyone understands what the community-wide objectives are, and make sure that there are no conflicts and people stepping on each other's toes. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip by these bullets, and if you want me to come back, I can go into the details. Step three is an internal facing document. This is the public relations playbook uh, and training. So this is training people who will be interviewed by the media or interacting with media in any way uh, and doing the internal facing kind of check in. What, are, what is our message here? How are we gonna communicate? Who are our primary communicators? Step four is the external facing document here. This is the media kit. These are the things that you're gonna hand to the media um, you know, anybody that you do earned media with, if you can convince the Chronicle or New York Times to come here, you hand them this press kit. Also digital versions as well. And there's a lot of content in there. Step five is a uh, Visit Crescent City website. So uh, another kind of hypothetical story I like to tell is there is a gentleman somewhere in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania right now who is living his life. And when the Olympics comes on, he's going to sit down and watch the Olympics. And he's going to see this story about Crescent City. And maybe he and his family have been planning for a vacation. And so says, hey, Crescent City sounds great. Perhaps the, the, the NBC Sports coverage doesn't say Del Norte County. What they say over and over again is Crescent City. So most people who go traveling these days, especially if they are looking for a place that they're very unfamiliar with, they're going to type in visitnameofcity.com. If they type in visitcrescentcity.com, they're not going to find anything. It doesn't exist. Instead, what you have is a visitdelnorthcounty.com site, which is great. What you want to do is channel people to this site by creating a Visit Crescent City website that becomes a landing page and a launch page to the, the, the product that you already have. People may not be familiar with the name Del Norte County. People typically don't travel to counties. They travel to cities, and then they radiate out from there. And so one task is to create a website called visitcrescentcity.com, which is really a channel to what you already have. Then the earned media outreach. This is the one task um, where I recommend hiring someone from outside the area. You want a professional public relations firm that has access to big international media outlets. And so you're really just trying to get your target media outlets to come here, then holding a press tour uh, and taking them on a tour all together. And uh, Visit California is also a, a remarkable organization. They have an office in Japan. They have an office in Europe. And so getting in front of Visit California is also a big part of this. Then stock video footage library. Create a B-roll. So this is background images, uh, people fishing. Uh, the fishing fleet, you know, leaving, going out from the docks, waves crashing on the beach, people farming or going to the farmer's market, um, whatever, just kind of background images that you can then have an hour plus content really well organized with a catalog that you can give to anybody that wants to do a video production. And uh, it makes it easier for them because then they have really high quality B-roll to use in the background as they're doing dub overs. Then, utilizing some of that B-roll and a little bit of extra um, video, um, produce some documentary videos. These are 30-second videos you can put on YouTube, you can put on your website, you can put on the Visit Del Norte County website. Uh, so a couple of 30 seconds, a couple of two-minute videos there. And then upgrade existing media outreach platforms. So you already have a lot of Facebook and Instagram accounts here, boosting those to spread the word. Uh, and that is the scope as proposed. There are some extra tasks in there as well.
Great, thank you. So one of the things that I would like to add is that we have an opportunity that we've never had before in a positive light, and we may never have again, at least not in my lifetime. We have over millions of dollars of positive exposure on NBC Sports for our small community here. And how do we capitalize on that? How do we help our community grow economically, grow with community pride, grow with you know every business, not just select businesses, but every business? And by having somebody with the scope of expertise that Rob has who can help us do that is the way to achieve it. I've worked with almost all of you on um, increasing tourism in this market for the last 12 years or so. This is an opportunity we will never see again. And what we're asking for is to help us make this happen. Thank you. Any questions? Questions from board members? Uh, thank you, Cindy. Rob, uh, compelling uh, presentation. So you're asking, your, your total um, outlay is $59,000, I'm understanding, of which you're asking the county of Del Norte for 15000 so who are the other partners? So we, we presented to the harbor this morning. We're waiting to hear back from them. The city has committed to 15,000. We have a list of others um, that will be seen and we should be able to reach that 59,000 that we need. You know, and again, um, nothing casting aspersions on anyone here in this presentation, but our experience with consultants in the past is, well, we've come up a lot short when we hire consultants and then expect certain results and then they don't come. So what makes this one different? It's unique aspect of this is once in a lifetime. I understand that, I can appreciate that. Uh, how do you think this will translate to helping the average person on our street who's not exactly engaged in this project of the county spending $15,000 to develop uh, a photo op uh, down the road? How do you see this playing out? You know, every single dollar that comes into this county helps us all. And so, you know, I don't know the exact return that we're going to have on this investment, but I do know this, if we don't do anything, it's going to be greatly diminished than what it could be. And so by being proactive and going after the dollars is how we're going to help our community grow. The other thing to hear that doesn't have a price tag on it is the community pride. 20 minutes of airtime on NBC to, to highlight our community I mean, we couldn't buy something like that, even with ad dollars. And so all of us are so proud of being here. We're also proud of our fishing fleet. We're so proud of our beaches and our fresh air and our clean water and our beautiful trees. And that's all going to be featured on NBC. And so even individuals who live here will want to tune in and have their moms watching and their cousins and their friends. And that can't be bought. Bob, go ahead. Go ahead. If I may, uh, Mr. Chair, could I expand on that a little? Sure. Yep. Quickly. Yep. Um, having spent five years in city government, I understand how difficult it is to spend money, and $59,000 is a lot. Um, so just to be clear, that's not all going to me. I'll be lucky to get 10% of that. Um, my job is really to facilitate a team, hire marketing specialists, hire public relations specialists. Uh, and all of the money that funds all of the county's operations are um, tax dollars. And so you've got property tax and sales tax and TOT tax um, to increase those. Sometimes you have to spend money. And I, you know, I don't want to seem condescending, but just a, a basic answer to your question is sometimes you have to spend money to make money. And so when you have an opportunity that you didn't expect, if you can invest into it more with the expectation that next year's sales tax will go up, next year's TOT will go up, um, that's the, the, the kind of the basis behind uh, the vision here. No, Rob, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, I think we've had the experience before, and I remember sitting on this board last year, and our city of Klamath asked for more money to it, develop its economic, and we were hard pressed to help this, the Klamath Chamber of Commerce develop its program. Now, this is a little different, I appreciate that, and this is a unique opportunity, well, I don't know, once in a lifetime, there are others opportunities will come, but this is a good one. So I can appreciate that. So we just have to justify the expense on a challenged budget, how we can allocate $15,000 a lot for our county, how we, can, how we can allocate and justify that to the people who we answer to, which is our constituents. So I thank you, Rob. It's a good presentation, Cindy. As always, I appreciate your input and 
helping us come to these decisions. Thank you. Yeah, Bob. Well, thank you. This is a budget transfer of funds, basically, that goes for economic development. So it's not like we're asking for additional dollars here. We already have this money. Uh, I think this is a great idea. I think it will develop uh, into additional funds coming into our restaurants and our motels and any number of things. Uh, yeah, national, international exposure, you can't buy that and you certainly can't buy it with $59,000. So we're saying, you know, $15,000 is an investment in our future. And so I'd like to move that we approve item number 30.1. Chris, you got uh, anything? Chair, one point of order, just, to, just so everybody understands, the, the vote would be on a budget transfer, which requires a four-fifths vote, so it would have to be unanimous. Okay, thank you. Chris, you got anything? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just going to say a couple of things uh, 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 about this, and, and I, I'm certainly in favor of it. And, and if uh, the, the only thing that I see that we have available is $10,000 that we might be able to use. So we don't have the $15,000 in, in what I see here. Uh, we would have to come up with the $5,000 out of something else, and I don't know where that's at. So I don't want to think that there's $15,000 uh, sitting there that uh, that we can do with that. But anyway, uh, I, I will take public comment now at this time. Linda Sutter. Yeah. It seems like, if I remember correctly, it was really hard press. Mr. Berkowitz, for you to get dollars for Klamath Chamber of Commerce. I could be wrong. I can't remember. The spending of taxpayers' dollars. And, and Ms. Vosburg, I appreciate you. I think you're a fantastic person. Really. I, I really do. I can't look at you. They tell me to look for it. <laughs> but the spending of taxpayers' dollars for a sister city, which was not voted on by the public is coming to a close. And I'm going to tell you why. There's a referendum in development for the next ballot. <coughs> <coughs> Until the people of Crescent City and Del Norte County have an opportunity to vote to spend our tax dollars on this sister city, I'm asking you to table this. It, if you remember correctly, when the boat vote, excuse me, when the boat, <coughs> Tony, wait, somebody read this. <laughs> okay. When the boat first arrived in Crescent City, students and others conducted fundraisers to fix it and send it back. This is something they need to continue to do, work for something they believe in, instead of treating this matter as another source of entitlement that the county does not have the money to spend on, nor should taxpayers have to use their precious tax dollars on, on a, the sister city in Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Good afternoon, almost. Uh, my name is Kevin Hartwick, uh, 190 Turnbull Lane in Crescent City. Um, the, uh, the offer that the chamber has made that put before you today is in reality as they spoke an opportunity to leverage on a multi-million dollar advertising campaign. It's as simple as that and it's very accurate. I agree with Ms. Vosberg, this is a once in a lifetime thing. We're not going to get it again. The NBC's filming has virtually been completed and it's been completed with a recognition of a sister city relationship as well as a focus on commerce. That's gonna air whether we do anything more or not. The reality is it's coming to our town. The real issue is whether everybody can participate in a process like this. And without organization, um, there is a high chance that the, those smaller businesses that employ smaller numbers of people can't get organized or involved in a process without being part of a process. 
and that was recognized earlier. There's going to be people that participate in an economic way simply because that's the way the world works. But it would be a great opportunity for all. The, the most classic example is going to be the recognition of the Dungeness uh, crab fleet in this process. They, the NBC has gone to great lengths to make sure that one of our proudest possessions is our crab fleet and the product that comes from this very dangerous coastline is featured as well as their own, uh, the oyster beds in, in Japan. This is a natural, this is one chance for uh, reconvening the community back around something that we've been proud of for a long, long time. The amount of money uh, today is, in, in, is a very small amount of money. The, the $10,000 doesn't go very far at all. The reality is it's symbolic. Um, the, if the request was in, was in my hands, I would revisit a, uh, a, uh, a, a much larger um, investment in this process. And I believe uh, this, your investment will stimulate private investment into the process. But it's a one-time shot. It's not coming again. You're not going to get this, this opportunity. The city has led. Um, the harbor is voting on it. Um, the consultant that you have, to uh, Mr. Gitlin's question, um, I've only met him uh, in one occasion, and I've seen his work in others. Um, I've seen his work immediately on this process, and this isn't the run-of-the-mill consultant relationship. Uh, what he's pointed out is he's building an infrastructure around something, and it's up to the community members to build in behind that, not him do the work that we don't ever see or possibly doesn't get done. It's really still in the shoulders of the local community to put the, to put the media press kits together, to build a video, video library, to do all the kind of stuff, and, and, put, and to pay for it. So there is going to be a substantial investment from the community to make this happen. So I appreciate uh, you entertaining it. Realizing, uh, realizing money is very, very tight. It's not, it's about that, but symbolically getting on board and then letting the rest of uh, the people go to work is, is very important. Thanks, Kevin. Any other public comment? Chris, you have something? Thanks, uh, Jerry. The I don't think it's any surprise to most folks that uh, we didn't know how this relationship was going to turn out when those students recovered that boat. But what we do know now is that it has captured the attention, hearts, and minds of the world. And it will be on public display fairly soon for us, July 24th, 2020. And as uh, Mr. Holman said, Ms. Vosberg said, we've uh, got very limited time in order to do that. Just reflecting on a few comments made by uh, Mr. Hartwick, um, it's not a lot. It's symbolic in nature. It doesn't go as far as probably what we need to. Um, I had Ms. Lopez take a look at our TOT revenue that we generated pretty much since 2007-2008 fiscal year with the implementation of the Travel and Tourism Marketing Plan for Delnert County Crescent City. It was a small investment at the time of $320,000, which was initially built by the city, the county, the harbor, Elk Valley Rancheria, Talawadini Nation, and several other private businesses to form a collective pot of about $320,000, which was set as a minimum baseline to market Delnart County, Crescent City regionally. Um, that was set by Sam Handelman, who many may remember as the professor from uh, Oregon State who developed Bend, Oregon, and their tourism travel to and from Bend. Um, that baseline was to present a regional impact that would extend beyond Medford, beyond Redding, but wouldn't reach the markets of Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, and elsewhere. Um, maintaining that impact through those marketing dollars, which we thought would come back to us with a return on investment from TOT and sales tax, was rather difficult in the coming years with budget crunches and more importantly, living through the economic downturns. But the commitment of previous boards was to ensure that the monies would continue flowing. I know this board has done that year after year after year to the Chamber of Commerce to try to maintain a specific level. Those dollar amounts have wavered over time, but in essence, they've been reduced drastically to where that marketing impact can't be felt. Before us today, we've, we've heard the discussion. 
back a decade or so ago that discussion was had the impact was felt and since that period of time and over a decade our ROI on just TOT to the county has increased over 83 percent and there's no question in my mind it's impacted everybody equally in this community how to get the additional exposure that we're going to have from this one-time impact is the question at, at us and before us now and I don't think it goes far enough now I know before us on the agenda we can't consider other pots but I would like this board at some time in the near future to consider other sources that we could invest in this project maybe not necessarily today but that fund that was set aside for us many years ago in 2003 via resolution from the Stimson fund could be that economic development tool that we could tap temporarily and pay it back potentially through TOT and sales tax back to that fund as the board originally intended but for now I agree with my fellow commissioners and more importantly I feel with the folks here in the audience that have expressed their concern that we do move on it strongly and and quickly that we should move forward with this and then revisit it sometime down the road in the near future to have that strong economic impact where everybody will feel the this this new visual this new heartfelt warmth that we've shared with the city of Rickas and Takata and get it out there for everybody to see so thank you for your presentation yeah thanks Chris uh, yeah I, I agree this this is is certainly a, uh, a a major opportunity for us to to, to move this uh, move this forward and I, I think we ought to be part of it uh, and I do think that uh, um, if there's other funding opportunities that we should look at those but what we've got before us now uh, I think is is probably going to be adequate so so um, what's did, the plan I hear that there was a motion on the table from Supervisor yes. Berkowitz there was a motion I'll second I have a motion and a second uh, that, just for clarification it's a two-part motion Supervisor Berkowitz correct okay it's the 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 request uh, well, uh, for the one-time funding for the Crescent City Del Norte Chamber of Commerce and number two the adoption of the budget transfer in, to, well, in the amount of 10,000 is that it's, correct? It's a little bit confusing though because yeah. the request is for 15 and we're authorizing 10. Right the the economic development money that's available is at $10,000 the board would have to take action on a different type of a transfer from a different fund in order to get to the 15. If the if the board chose to do that then it would be in December but for today's action it's 10. So are we only acting on on portion two of this then and authorizing the the uh, budget transfer for the 10,000? Right so the board the board action on the transfer would be the approval of the funding. Okay so we're not actually doing both items only the one you considered and now you're taking action on okay. the funding all right you got that Kylie we're good with that yes I have a motion from Supervisor Berkowitz and a second from Supervisor Gillen okay so would you pull, pull the vote please Supervisor Howard yes Supervisor Gitlin yes Supervisor Berkowitz yes Vice Chair Hemmingson yes at this time we'll take about a five minute uh, recess and we'll gather our chair and we'll move on at uh, 1227.
We're going to go to item 31, approve and authorize the chair to sign the lease termination agreement with Matthew Farring as individual doing business at Front Street Plaza, the property located at 1279 2nd Street. Madam Chair, I need to recuse myself. I have a conflict of interest. Uh, Matthew Farring is a customer. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I have brought you a new and improved lease termination agreement for the 2nd Street property. Um, I won't go, I'll spare you the details of, of the um, summary, which are all in the board report, and just say I think this is um, our best option at this point. I am, I guess I would say, pathologically optimistic that you'll agree with me today. So, um, do you have any questions? Any questions from the board? I just want to appreciate the additional work that you've done on this, or to be able to negotiate a, an agreement that we hopefully all can accept. Okay, I'll take public comment th right now and, um, on item 31. Tony Barnes, here I am again. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time and rehash what I've talked about in the past with you guys, but what I am going to do is that I've got a handout that I was going to read. Give to all. Uh, basically, I just want to... I guess what I really want to say is that uh, there's no need for me to go over the issues that I think is, I find it that you're in a difficult situation. And I think that uh, this situation probably could have been avoided by the county had you taken time with the lease when you initially negotiated it, had you anticipated your needs. I think that there were things that you could have done to have mitigated getting yourself into this situation. I think that you could have uh, given the space out to the brokerage community, see if it could have been leased. I think that you could have tried to release it yourselves. Perhaps the owner could have leased the space. However, however it came down, you, found, you find yourself in this difficult situation. And so the decision, uh, I would, it's a difficult situation. I would recommend that you pay the penalty and get out of the lease and go forward. And that you avoid getting yourself into this situation in the future by properly negotiating a lease that contains the proper clauses that gives you the option to get out without a huge penalty like this. This is a lot of, a lot of money, whether the state pays it or the county pays it. My bigger concern on this is that in going forward, my objections with you have been that I don't think you followed proper procedures, at least with me, in the negotiation for the space that you were considering for family support. I don't think it was properly vetted. My numbers were never represented. It never went through future facilities planning. And yet it wound up on your agenda to approve. So I want to remind all of you that you all work for us. We don't work for you. It's incumbent upon you to do your jobs and to do your jobs properly and to follow proper procedures and to not show favoritism and to uh, make sure you vet whatever options are in front of you properly, which really wasn't done. I'm not going to rehash it. You can read what I gave you, but it wasn't done. And it borderlines on uh, being unethical, possibly illegal. So. <coughs> What I want to impress upon you is that you're coming out with a new RFP, and we expect you to do your job properly, properly, pro properly <coughs> vet the proposals that are before you, um, properly analyze them, and properly present them. That is your job. I don't have any other comments. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. On item Madam number Chairman, I'll, I'll make that motion to approve the lease. And again, so the public is aware of what has taken place. Uh, there was originally, 11 months ago, an opportunity for us to settle this for $163,000. It's $30,078, something like that, paid in this last 10 months. And the real savings on this $90,000 settlement is about $43,000 to the taxpayer, albeit federal and or state funds, but money that is not yet spent, and that's good news. So I'll make the motion to enter into the termination agreement with Matthew Farring, uh, 
Front Street Plaza LLC for the property located at 1279 2nd Street, uh, effective November 30th, as requested by the Director of Health and Human Services. Second. I have a motion and a second. Ready to public comment, Kylie? Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Chair Cowan? Yes. Chris, can you grab Jerry? Thanks. Okay, that brings us to item our budget transfers. We have one, two, three, four, five different budget transfers. The talk budget transfers. We have 11 01, 11 02, 11 03, 11 04, and 11 06. Motion to approve 11 01, 11 02, 11 03, 11 04, 11 06 as listed uh, on the agenda. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any public comment on the budget transfers? Seeing none, Kylie? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Chair Cowan? Yes. Okay. Is there any legislative um, issues that we need to talk about? None Mr. for board Samantha? action today. Okay, thank Madam you. Madam Chair? Yes. I if, if I may, um, I'd like to set an item for or discussion at our next meeting specific to legislative actions, and that would be um, HR 4916, um, introduced by Representative uh, Lofgren on uh, October 31st, 2019. And it's the Farm Workforce Modernization Act of 2019. This bill uh, really has a chance to impact quite consistently immigration here within the United States. Right now, this bill is uh, moving forward very rapidly through a bipartisan nature in the House and has uh, 46 co-sponsors to it, both Republican and Democrat, um, 13 in all from the state of California, 20 states in all signing on. Um, and it's been discussed by uh, President Trump that he would sign it if it does reach his desk. I think this is an opportune time for us to add it to our agenda, agenda and encourage uh, Congressman Huffman to be a co-sponsor if possible. If you could shoot an email to Kylie and myself, just follow that procedure and we'll make sure it gets on. Thank you. And that will be the end of our meeting and we'll see everybody in December. Have a happy Thanksgiving.